In the previous video, we looked at some of the electrical power challenges faced by the southwest county of Cornwall. And in this video, we're going to substantiate some of the things that we spoke about using specific data. So first of all, we're going to look at UK and Cornwall electricity demand data so that we can begin to understand how much electricity the UK uses on a day-to-day -day basis and how that translates to the amount of energy used by Cornwall. We'll then look at Cornwall's capacity for generating electricity through renewable sources. And finally, we'll look at why the use of renewables often means that we have a requirement for storage of electricity. And we'll go on to talk about some of the potential solutions to storing electrical energy. So to begin with, let's look at the UK and Cornwall's demand for electricity. So we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at overall demand on an annual basis. We're going to look at peak demand, which is the maximum amount of electricity that's required at any given point in time. And finally, we're going to look at average demand on a day-to-day -day basis. So the diagram that we're looking at here is the final energy demand by fuel type for the entire UK. Now the units that are used here are kilotons of oil equivalent. So what we're doing is we're comparing the amount of energy used with the equivalent energy stored in oil. Now on the graph we see five categories, electricity, gas, petroleum, coal and renewables. Now just so that we can distinguish between renewables and electricity, I'm just going to read a statement that comes out of this document which is freely available on the Cornwall government website. It says, it should be noted that the projections assume that by 2020, around 30% of the electricity used by consumers in the UK will come from renewable energy sources, and that will be in line with the UK targets. It then goes on to state that the renewables and biofuel energy consumption category refers to fuels consumed as a primary fuel rather than those used to produce electricity. Now what that's basically saying is that that's renewable energy sources used for things other than the production of electricity. So it could be used for heating or it could be used for transport as an example. Therefore the electricity usage bar is actually going to incorporate things such as our energy produced from wind farms and solar and so on. So what we see here is that for the entire UK in the year 2007, an overall demand of around 30,000 kilotons of oil equivalent. And we see that remaining fairly consistent through 2015, 2020, 2025 and so on. So some of these will be actual values and some will be projections. Now whilst we're discussing the UK as a whole, let's also consider the peak demand. Now the highest demand on the national grid was in 2017 and that peak demand reached 57 gigawatts. Now it's important to note that a gigawatt is a measure of energy per second. So this demand may have only lasted for a second or it may have lasted for an hour or longer. But the important thing is the maximum amount of energy used in any given instant was 57 gigajoules. And as that related to any given instant, the power being consumed was 57 gigawatts. What this really means is that our electricity network needs to be capable of supplying 57 gigawatts of energy to ensure that there's no power outages. Obviously, if this peak value were to increase in 2019, 2020 or later years, then our capacity to produce that peak value would also need to increase. But how does this translate into the average amount of energy that we need at any given time? Well, the charts that we're looking at here give a more realistic estimate as to how much energy we're using on a given basis. Now, at the time this data was taken, we had energy usage in the previous day and energy usage in the current day. And I'll show you how you can obtain this data for yourself in a moment. So what we see in the previous day, energy usage, or more accurately, power usage, because this is measured in gigawatts, is sitting very close to 40 gigawatts or between 35 and 40 gigawatts. We see it around 6 p.m., but that actually rises just above 40 gigawatts before dropping off towards midnight. At one in the morning of the current day, we see that demand is somewhat lower at around 25 gigawatts, but that increases at around eight in the morning 
back to around 35 to 40 gigawatts. So we see a definite trend there. Now the diagram below shows average energy usage across the year. So we see the 11 months of the year up to the current time, November 2018, and these will be the average consumptions on a daily basis. So we see average daily consumption starting at around 30 gigawatts. In February, we had an average daily consumption above 40 gigawatts and so on. So we see that the demand reduces in the summer to around 30 gigawatts and increases in the winter up to around 40 gigawatts. Now there's an excellent resource for obtaining this type of data and it's called Gridwatch. The URL is gridwatch.co.uk. So let's just have a brief look at that resource now. So in addition to the data that we've just spoken about, there's a wealth of other data. It's got the overall UK demand. It's got how much of that energy is coming from renewables. And it's got how much is coming from coal and nuclear. It also breaks the renewables down into solar, wind, hydro and so on. We also see how much energy we're currently drawing through our interconnectors. So we're currently drawing two gigawatts through the interconnector with France. And there's all sorts of other information that you may find interesting with regards to how much energy we're using at any given moment in time. So let's just return to the previous charts. So underneath each of these charts, we actually see a summary with the minimum demand, maximum demand and the average demand. And we also see that on our graph of annual usage, minimum demand 18.8 gigawatts, maximum demand 50.4 gigawatts. So quite a significant peak there and an average of around 31.1 gigawatts. So there's lots of useful information there about the total amount of electricity that's being used within the UK at any given time. Now for the purpose of our case study, we're actually interested in Cornwall and their consumption. Now also on the Cornwall government website, we have a document called the projected energy consumption in Cornwall. And if you're logged into the study platform, I'm going to provide a link to this resource directly underneath the video. Now in this document, what the Cornwall government has done is approximate its own consumption based on the consumption within the UK. And there's details in the document as to how this approximation has been made. It will be based on things such as the number of households and the number of businesses, as an example. But what we see is that Cornwall's demand is around 250 kilotons of oil when compared to the UK's 30,000 kilotons of oil. And although we see that amount reducing and then increasing, we can approximate that to around 250 kilotons of oil. So for the purpose of comparison, we need to approximate Cornwall's peak usage and their average usage. So recall that the peak usage in the UK was 57 gigawatts. That's represented by this 57 here. And as a fraction, we're assuming that Cornwall uses 250 kilotons of oil per year when compared to 30,000 kilotons of oil per year in the UK. Now using that fraction, we can see that the peak demand for electricity in Cornwall is likely to be around 0.475 gigawatts. And this would be quite a crude estimation, but at least it gives us a basis for comparison. 0.475 gigawatts is the same as 475 megawatts. Therefore, the peak demand in Cornwall is likely to be 475 megawatts, which is 475 megajoules in any given second. And as we said previously, that demand might last for one second, it might last for a minute or an hour. But what we need to ensure is that we're able to supply that amount of electricity to the county of Cornwall. Now let's approximate the average demand. So based on the average consumption of power in the UK for the year 2018 to date, we see an average of 32 gigawatts. So once again, I've applied our fraction of 250 over 30,000, and I've come up with a value of 267 megawatts. So that means on average, within Cornwall, we would be drawing 267 megawatts of power. So although on average we need to be able to produce 267 megawatts of power, 
we also need to be capable of producing 475 megawatts of power. OK, so now we have some data to support the overall demand for electricity in both the UK and Cornwall. We also have some data to support peak demand and we also have some data to support average demand. Next, let's look at the County of Cornwall's capacity for producing energy from renewable sources. We're going to look at a couple of things. We're going to look at installed capacity and we're also going to talk about something called capacity factor. And finally, we'll discuss capacity margins. So this table here summarises the amount of installed capacity for different renewable energy sources within the County of Cornwall. And we see that the main two here are wind energy with an installed capacity of 141 megawatts. And we see large scale solar with an installed capacity of 454 megawatts and small scale solar with an installed capacity of 88 megawatts. All of the other renewable sources are contributing very little in comparison. And in fact, these top three account for over 97% of all of the installed capacity. So we're going to focus on these three. Now the sum of those three equals 683 megawatts. So let's just compare that to our demand. So looking at our demand, we said that we had a peak requirement of 475 megawatts and an average requirement of 267 megawatts. So on face value, looking at the data, we would assume that Cornwall was more than capable of producing all of its electricity from renewable sources. But one thing we haven't factored in yet is that this relates to installed capacity. Now, we can never expect a wind turbine to produce its maximum rated power 100% of the time, and we also can't expect a solar panel to produce 100% of its rated power 100% of the time. So here we have to factor in something called capacity factors. Now, the simplest way to explain capacity factor is that it's the amount of rated power or rated energy that a wind turbine or a wind farm actually produces. And on the second graph, we have capacity factor for a solar array or a solar power plant. Now, if we refer to our wind capacity factors, first of all, what this shows in the UK is that an onshore wind farm produces somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of its rated power on average. The data for an offshore wind farm is slightly better, with averages between 30 and 40% of their rated power. So let's combine the two, and what we notice is that in the UK, a wind turbine or a wind farm is going to have a capacity factor of around 30%. The reason the capacity factors for Germany are lower is because their average wind speeds will be lower. And recall that wind speed has a direct impact on the amount of energy that a wind turbine produces. So the value we're going to use for reference will be 30%. Now the capacity factors for solar are much lower and the reasons behind that should be relatively obvious. Obviously during night time we can't produce solar energy and also during certain seasons and certain weather conditions the amount of radiated energy from the sun is going to be less. So here we see capacity factors of around 10%. So of the rated power of a solar power plant we're actually only going to yield around 10% of the energy. So let's refer back to our data one last time. If we have an installed capacity of 141 megawatts, but we're only actually going to produce 30% of that energy, then in reality, we're only going to produce 42.3 megawatts of energy on average. And if we're only going to yield 10% of our capacity from a solar farm, then we're only actually going to get 10% of each of these values. So here, 10% would be 45.4 megawatts, and here, 10% would be 8.8 .8 megawatts. So if we add these three together, incorporating our capacity factors, our total generating potential becomes 42.3 for wind, plus 45.4 for large-scale solar, plus 8.8 .8 for small-scale solar, giving us a combined total of 97 megawatts 
So although the installed capacity is much higher, the likely amount of energy that we're going to produce from these top three is 96.6 or 97 megawatts of power. So comparing that 97 megawatts to our peak requirement and comparing that 97 megawatts to our average requirement, what we can see is there's quite a significant shortfall between those values. This would indicate that if Cornwall wants to be self-sufficient in terms of the amount of electricity they use, then they do still need to increase their amount of capacity from renewable energy sources. So we've talked about a couple of important things there. We've talked about Cornwall's installed capacity, and we've talked about something called capacity factor. Now what we've seen as a result is that Cornwall doesn't have a capacity margin. Cornwall doesn't produce a surplus of electricity when compared to the amount they're consuming. In order to have a capacity margin, Cornwall would need to produce more than their peak requirement for electricity. So they would have to have the capacity to produce more than 475 megawatts of power. So in this video, we've looked at the UK and Cornwall's electricity demands, and we've also looked at Cornwall's capacity to cover their own demand from renewable energy sources. And what we've seen is that there's still a shortfall. They still need to increase the amount of energy they can produce from renewables in order to cover their own demand. Now, one other point that's important to consider when using renewable energy sources is energy storage requirements. Because what we've looked at there is average demand and average production capacity, but demand and production fluctuate. So in the middle of a summer's day, if it's windy, then we can produce a huge amount of energy from wind and solar. But at night time, on a non-windy day or a non-windy night, our energy production capabilities is going to become almost zero. So what we need to be able to do is store energy when we produce a surplus and then dissipate that energy when we have a deficit. We looked at some different energy storage methods in an earlier tutorial, but one of the significant challenges that are faced when being wholly reliant on renewable energy sources is how we're going to store that energy. At the time of recording this video, the use of batteries and capacitors isn't really a viable option because that energy will be lost over a period of time. One of the more practical solutions that we looked at was pumped storage stations for hydroelectricity. So if we can combine the use of renewable energies with a viable storage technology, then potentially we can overcome this challenge of meeting our energy demands using purely renewable energy sources.